Hello, Spark fans, and welcome back to Advancing Spark, where I know it has been weeks since we last caught up. Now, there's a few reasons for that. Firstly, we had SQL Bits, which was the one of the biggest uh, Microsoft-based data conferences in Europe, and it was in person for the first time in years. So Advancing Analytics were out in force, having a lot of fun there. And then I caught a little thing called COVID. So I've been out for the last week, barely able to speak, sounding like a London gangster. And yeah, I'm now feeling better. So hello, normal service is resumed and we'll get back into it. Today is a video I promised a few weeks ago where we had a quick video looking at getting started with Feature Store where we had Gavi come in and show us through that kind of getting started Titanic um, notebook showing you how Feature Store works. Now, that was doing a load of stuff. It was creating some tables, it was doing merge operations, it was doing things all via the Feature Store API to make it look nice and easy. Uh, and I was sitting there going, hmm, hmm, I want to see what's going on under the hood. What is the data engineering side of what's happening when we're using Feature Store? So this should be a fairly short video. I just want to run through when it creates tables, when it does things like a merge, when it writes data, what is happening to the data? Where is the data? How is it held? What's happening to that Delta table? And we can have a look and we can find out and get a good understanding of what's going on inside our Feature Store. So that's the plan. So today is data engineering side of Feature Store. And we're going to have a look through that original notebook and just tweak and tailor it and get it into a state where we can see a bit more of what's going on. That's the plan. All right. As always, do not forget to like and subscribe if you are new around here. Go and watch the original Feature Store intro video if you haven't watched that yet to get an idea of what we're talking about. And then, yeah, let's go and see what we got. So I have this Feature Engineering Titanic notebook. So this is a notebook that Gavi has shared. Um, there's a link to her blog uh, that I'll kind of put down below. And we can have a run through and see what it's doing. So it's assuming that we're, I mean, assume that you are in the machine learning workspace. You don't have to be. Uh, very importantly, assume that you are in a cluster that is ML enabled. So it has to be an ML cluster to have the Feature Store libraries installed. So when you create a cluster, you need to make sure the runtime version you're choosing is one of the ML ones, not the standard ones, and then you'll be fine. And yes, I know there's, there's things that we need to talk about. 10.4, loads of stuff going on. Okay, so if we go back to that notebook, mm, 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 so we can follow it through and run it from there. So first things first, importing some libraries. That's all fairly standard. Again, you won't have these unless you are using the ML side of things. And then we've got this. So number one, and I was, I was making faces to Gavi at the time because file store or DBFS slash file store means that the file has been just uploaded to Databricks. So you've kind of gone into Databricks, you've gone into Workspace and said, upload some data, here's the CSV, and it's put it inside DBFS, the Databricks file system. And that isn't great because essentially anyone with access to Databricks has access to DBFS. So there's no security, there's no granular, you can see that folder, you can't see that folder. So if you put data into DBFS, pretty much anyone who has the ability to read files can read the data that's in there. So as a default practice as a data engineer, we do not put any data into DBFS. I mean, sure, in this case, it's a little experiment, it's a quick training exercise, it doesn't matter. So let Gavi off, it's fine. But realistically, what we should have done is grab that data put it into a lake and then reference that lake. So I've got my lake here. I've created a folder in my lab. Well, what do I call it? I call it ML Titanic. And I've got those two files. So instead of uploading it directly into DBFS and having it kind of uh, DBFS decide to put it into that kind of um, file store, I just pointed it straight to the lake. So first things first, I'm going to take that and switch that over to the, my mount point to my lake. And then to that particular folder, so it's inside lab, inside ML, inside Titanic. Titanic. There we go. We should be able to refer to that folder. Doing exactly the same thing, just best practice. Don't use DBFS to store customer data. It's not the most secure place and you can't see it and you can't control it. And it's it's a little bit black boxy. Good. Uh, I mean, so this, so spark.read.csv, I won't complain about it. That's not how I write it. I prefer to do .option and then pass in the various configurations. It's fine. It works. Obviously, .csv, I wouldn't write. Normally, I do .format .csv and then um, .load. But we're not trying to make this a generic handler. Everything I do is trying to build the script in the most generic way as possible so we can make it parameterized. We're not doing that here. It doesn't really matter. Different sides of the fence, right? 
Uh, looking at the data, that's all fine. Describing the data, it's great. Go in, have a look at things and see what's going on. Again, you've got the data profile these days, so you don't always have to use .describe. You can just open a table, hit data profile, and that will show you kind of the, the summarized statistics of it. And going through and doing some cleaning. This is all absolutely sensible. This all makes sense. I don't know why we've got a select name that's not doing anything, but we can go and look at that. Bring a column in, doing a bit of regex. That's all fine. This one's an interesting one. So doing a replace and saying, well, here's a list of things to replace and here's a list of values to replace it with. And yeah, that, that, that makes sense. For me, that's fairly, it's fairly hard coded. I'd probably make that into a lookup table of its own. I'll probably make a list of, well, this title should translate to this group. This title is this title group. This title is this title group. And I'd make that as a lookup table. So if I did any other particular bit of um, data science, any engineering that needed that same translation, we can reuse it. Absolutely fine as a one-off experiment. It doesn't make too much difference. And yeah, just make sure we have run that. Run it. And then, yeah, okay, doing our various different bits of feature engineering. Okay, so then doing a select, tidying it down to just the features that we actually need. And that's all fairly standard stuff. So we're not actually doing any re uh, feature store stuff at this point. Okay, we then get to this point. So create database, if not exists, that feature store Titanic. Now, one of the problems here is that this is all going to be essentially creating managed tables for us. So we're going to be creating a database. And then any tables that we create in that database, it's going to store the data next to where that database lives. Uh, and in by default, that's DBFS again. So any feature store items that we create are stored in DBFS with no security, with no granular access, with no control over who can see it, all that kind of stuff. And I'm, I'm kind of sway back and forwards in this one because it's feature store. And you assume the only people using feature store are going to be people actually in that workspace. Is that true? What if you're using various different workspaces and you want to share those feature store lookup tables? But the, the easy way around that, which I didn't, I only actually discovered recently, uh, is you can give, when you create a Hive database, you can give that a default location. So we can actually say, well, actually, I want this to live in my lake. And I want that to be in my feature store. Go and create stuff there. And that means if we just do dot save as table and we put it into feature store dot uh, Titanic, then it's going to store it actually in my lake all the same. If we do using feature store, create a table and go and store it down, it's going to store it at a place where we can see it. So just that little tweak to say, I want you to create a database in a place that I can actually go and look at it, means we can then go and have a look at the delta tables. We can go and see what it's doing under the hood. Okay, so we've then got a few bits and pieces. So it's creating a feature store clients and it's creating that table. So we're giving it a table name and that very importantly, that table name is inside that database we just created. So when it goes and creates that table, it's going to do it at that default location. So we've got control now over where this managed table gets created. So we're going to go and create it. It's giving it a primary key. We're passing in that data frame to go and use it. We say, off you go, go and create that. That's not going to work because it already exists because I haven't changed the name of it. Let's just do, sure, why not? We've got a difference here between things registered in feature store and the actual hive objects. So I cleaned up the hive database, I cleaned up the hive tables, I cleaned up the actual data in the lake, I hadn't removed it from the feature store. So the feature store metadata object still existed. Um, so tidy it up. We'll make sure we go through and work that out in my various other examples. So feature store Titanic, Titanic passenger features. And it's now created. So we'll be able to go into data. I've got loads of things in here. Uh, what do they even call it? Titanic, feature store Titanic. And we can see that table just exists in Hive. It's kind of created that table for us. More interesting is if we go over into our lake, we can see feature store as a directory has been created. We've got that Titanic passenger features table. And you can see it's a delta table. It's a delta table the same as if we went and created that. I've got one, I've got some data. So what we've actually done, so this creates table has populated it with data. So we can actually go in here look at the delta log and see what's happened. And we've got already got two entries in here. So we've got one bit, Jason, what's this one doing? So this is just, so it's created the table. It's given it a schema. So it's kind of, sort of set up that empty table. It's done a create table as a select, but then left empty because there's no files mentioned here. So it's kind of just done an initial setup to create an empty delta table that we can then play with later. 
So it looks like it's doing it in two steps. So we've got greater shell, empty delta table, register it with Hive, get all that stuff set up. And then as a second pass, got an add of a file. So going and adding in some parquet with my information in there. And it's creating or replacing that existing table. So it's just basically sort of get your shell table there. Right, okay, that worked. Overwrite it with the same table with data inside. Weird way, but makes sense. Uh, and then now we've got some data in there, so, you know, so we should have da -da -da, columns, no records. There's now 891 records in my feature table. So you can see, so that little create table command. Yes, it's talking to the feature store API. It's logging things with feature store. We're getting all the metadata and the controls around feature store. But under the hood, it's just running some SQL statements to go and interact and work with that hive table, which is a Delta table mapped into my lake. So you can kind of start to understand what's actually happening under the hood when we're calling this API. The next step, so we've got the same again. So we're just writing to that table. So rather than creating a table, we're just basically putting more data into it. And we could do an overwrite and that would be a straight, essentially it'd run the same command, create uh, or replace table. Uh, in this case, we're doing a merge. So saying we'll take actually just the same data, merge into that data again. Um, we've got the keys that it joins on. And when we defined it, we told it what the primary keys are. And that's metadata held at the feature store API level. And we can do that. It's running a merge operation. And we'll go and see it's basically just doing normal Delta stuff. So if we go back over here, see there was another operation. We should see there's more Parquet. So we've got two more Parquet files now. We can go and have a look what happened inside there. And we can see it removed the old one and it created two new files. Getting one with updates, one with deletes. Uh, you can see the predicate it's created. So it did, an, it did a merge operation, which makes sense. We told it it should merge. It's automatically created that merge predicate where my updates table has a name, my delta table has a name, my updates table has cabin, my destination table has cabin. And that's because when we created it, we specified these primary keys. So it's assuming that the, those keys exist on each side, assuming that the data frame you're passing in is in the right shape actually go into that feature table a lot of assumptions that it's making so that it can automate and write that code for you but that again that's that's all it's doing it's just writing a merge statement that it can then go and execute for you okay so that that makes sense that was all good and then after that it's essentially just spark queries over a delta table so go and read that particular table that brings back a data frame that we can go and work with it uh there's no in there actually sort of you might see that if you ran through that saying we used the dot keys function, where it's now deprecated that, and you can now just call primary keys. And that does the exact same thing. It's just to change the name in the uh, thing. You need to kind of make sure that's up to date. And then pretty much everything else in here is fairly just standard going off and working, working with Spark, working with the Delta table, and then doing some training and um, actually doing some ML. Um, it's interesting when you look at these feature lookups, we can go and actually see what it's doing whenever we interact with that table. Let's take that one. If we just take that read, we can go and say, what actually happened there? We can go and have a look in the Spark UI as normal. We can go and have a look at the associated SQL query. And we can go and see what's actually happening. Well, it read a record. It brought back one record. It didn't really do much with that record. And then we can go and have a look at a later query. We go to what's actually happening in there. And we should see way more records. So it's kind of seeming like it's got two different things. You've got interactions with the feature store API to just go and read the metadata about that feature store table. And then you've got interactions with the Delta table to actually go and bring records back and actually go and work with the, the actual data. So it'll be a bit weird when you see the various things coming back. If you're doing feature store operations and you're doing data access stuff, you'll see them separate as different options. Talking to the feature store, talking to the actual Delta table in the lake. That kind of makes sense. The whole point is this is an abstraction layer making life easier. So of course it's going to have a couple of extra calls that it's doing in between some stuff. The same thing here will be kind of going off and having a look into those things. I think I've got that feature look up too. I've not changed the idea of things, but you can see it's going back and forwards, kind of just talk to the feature store metadata, talk to the Delta Lake when it needs to. But other than that, it's just a Delta Lake table. And so you can do all the normal stuff. That table, once it's registered with Hive, we can go and say, well, actually, I want to know, I want to know what that is. So uh, we can do percentage SQL. I can do describe detail of that table. What is that? Where does it live? What's going on there? 
and it just recognizes it as a standard delta table. So it's not like so if it's, it always has to go through the feature store API. You can interact with that just as a perfectly normal delta table. Um, number of files, number of rows, you can see all that kind of normal and stuff. We can go in and say, well, just, I want to, I don't want to do a feature store, get the table, read a table. I just want to do a select star from my table. And I can go and have a look at what that table looks like. And I can see it is just, just a delta table of my information. The other thing feature store is doing for us is just abstracting away from those normal operations, writing a merge statement and actually writing out the SQL for the merge statement or the, the PySpark to do that merge statement is slightly annoying. Whereas just writing that little, what have we got up here? That write a table, that's the table, merge into it. And it knows how to, knows the keys to join on and it knows what uh, the operations it needs to do. It's just a little bit easier. That's all it is. So it, from what we can see, the data is stored exactly the same as any other data. You could do things like you could run a um, an optimize on it. You can run a vacuum on it if you've merged into it. And in fact, you should be doing those things. Uh, one thing I've not had a look at is if feature store doing any of that itself. If it's actually going to run the occasional management operation on your feature store if you're going and running these things. But I do want to have a look and say, what, what's the, the long term life cycle of a feature store table? What if you've got millions of rows in your feature store lookup? Should you? Is that a bad thing? Because you can do it as a delta table. That's fine. Doing it via this abstraction layer of the feature store, if it's not managing itself in terms of vacuums and optimizers and that kind of stuff, that can cause problems. What if we want to partition the table? And absolutely, we could just partition the table, do a switcheroo, get it in place underneath it, leave the feature store pointer pointing at that delta table and just know that the delta table will work a bit better. There's various things that we can do, but it's just how much is doing it for you and how much is actually something you need to think about under the hood. It's going to be interesting. But cool, that is literally all I wanted to show today, all I wanted to talk through today. Just having a look at what actually is it doing under the hood. And it's essentially just writing some SQL statements to work with Delta on our behalf. It's creating a managed Delta table. It's registering that table with Hive. It's putting that table wherever the default location for the database is. And do not forget that if you create a Hive database, you can tell it where the default location is. So if anyone creates a table and saves a table to that place, it'll put it to the right place in the lake, not necessarily in DBFS. And then you've got control. You can do manage your ACL. So you can say, well, who, who can read that data? Who can write that data? Who can, who can work with that stuff? You can manage table access control on the Hive layer to then work and say, who can actually do that? You can secure it like a good professional enterprise company. You can work within those boundaries as long as you've set it up in the right way. So just have a bit of consideration when you're setting up your feature store, when you're getting things ready, when you're saying, it's dead scientists, you'll let loose, go and create this stuff. You can do a little bit of preliminary engineering just to make their lives easier and make things a bit faster and a bit better in the end. And yeah, that is it. That's my little journey of discovery, having a quick peek under the covers of feature store and seeing what's going on at the Delta table underneath. Have a go yourself. If you're working with feature store, consider switching the location of that database and then look at the Delta tables. Look at what management operations they need. Look at how efficient they are over time. Do, can we just optimize it without worrying about disrupting the rest of the feature store process? Because you've got that, you can talk to Delta directly without going through feature store and that's perfectly fine. Yeah, interesting stuff. All right, I will leave you there. Now, there are a load of videos coming up. Obviously, we've had announcements this week, things like Unity Catalog going into public preview, Delta Sharing going into public preview. There's a whole load of things I can now talk about. So there's loads of videos coming up soon. And yeah, as always, don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.